Okay. Uh, good morning from Miami. My name is Jorge Ruiz. I'm a geriatrician and investigator at the Miami Greg and faculty at University of Miami. And I'm part of the organizing committee for the Frenzy Seminar Series. Uh, on behalf of the organizing committee, I welcome you to the last webinar of our 20, 2021 to 2022 uh, series. So today, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our distinguished speaker, a member of the Friday Seminar Series Organizing Committee, Dr. Gustavo Duque. I'm gonna be brief in the interest of time, uh, but uh, we can talk many a lot about the accomplishments that, of Dr. Duque in the areas of geriatrics, frailty, and, and bone research. Uh, Professor Duque is a geriatrician, clinician, investigator, a biomedical researcher with 18 years of experience in aging, clinical epidemiology, bone metabolism, and musculoskeletal disease, and special research interest in the mechanism of age-related loss, osteoporosis, and frailty in older person. He received training uh, in his native Colombia, Universidad Javeriana, and completed uh, uh, geriatric medicine training at McGill University, Montreal, Canada, and then in the same school, medical school, obtain a PhD in experimental medicine. He is currently the chair of the geriatric medicine, Western Health at Melbourne Medical School uh, in Australia and director of the Australian Institute of Musculoskelet for Musculoskeletal Science. His research team comprises 20 members and he has been investigator in multiple funded uh, studies by government, private foundations and industry, including multiple randomized controlled trials, five longitudinal cohorts and multiple investigator initiated clinical trials and has published several peer review articles in high impact journals, books, book chapters and deliver conferences around the world. So you'll hear a lot about his research today uh, and his major accomplishments in, and contributions to the field of frailty and bone research. Uh, and the title of his presentation is Sarcopenia and Frailty. I want to remind you to use the Q&A button to submit your questions. Please avoid the chat button as possible. And I also want to remind you at the end of this webinar, you will be receiving an evaluation link or email uh, and we will definitely appreciate your feedback. So Gustavo, please, uh, you can start sharing your, your screen. Okay, can you see it? Yes, yes, perfect. So I'm gonna... Okay, thank you very much, Jorge. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm uh, very happy and honored to present today. And I would like to thank the committee for inviting me to talk to you about uh, these uh, two connected topics. I would like to start with, for apologize, uh, to apologize uh, for the initial technical issues, but um, you know, it's 2 a.m. in Australia, so uh, we are not functioning at the same pace, but uh, still, very happy to uh, take this time to share with you um, some updates and also some of our data in terms of the connections between osteosarcopenia and frailty. So um, let's start by uh, um, illustrating a little bit about the concept of osteosarcopenia and how the story started. Basically, with time, uh, we uh, started to realize that um, two events that are very frequent in, uh, in older persons uh, could be connected. And um, we started to think about this uh, connection in a way that people who fall uh, eventually or in a, in a significant numbers could fracture, could break their bones. And also people who are uh, an osteoporotic or have low, low bone mass uh, could be at risk of falling. So this connection was um, some, somehow uh, there. We were talking about it, but the definition as such, the connection as such, was not clear until probably about 10 or 12 years ago. And after that, a couple of uh, colleagues in Wisconsin, uh, Neil Blinkley and uh, Jill Burring, um, postulated the concept of sarco-osteopenia to uh, define these people who have at the same time osteoporosis and sarcopenia. The terminology has evolved and um, we have reached a point where we now understand much better 
this connection and this link between osteoporosis and sarcopenia in what we call a, um, an entity. A, 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 a not, we're not talking here a, about a disease, we're talking about two diseases that are connected, very much interconnected, not only because of the shared, phys um, shared um, mechanisms, but also because of the uh, outcomes uh, that we, um, or the adverse outcomes that we observe in these patients. So uh, we started talking about osteosarcopenia in a sense that we have this connection and crosstalk between the uh, muscle and bone. And also we have this um, biochemical, mechanical, hormonal uh, interconnection between the muscle and bone tissues. When we look at this from the perspective of uh, clinical impact, we know that people with osteosarcopenia is a high risk of adverse outcomes. I'm going to, uh, to talk about it later on. So this is where we are at the moment in terms of understanding uh, the concept of osteosarcopenia. We, even, uh, we have even proposed osteosarcopenia as a geriatric syndrome. And um, you will probably tell me, how are you going to define this? Is there a definition? Is there a global definition? As you know, sometimes we are always talking about these global definitions, particularly in geriatrics. And um, well, it's very easy. We don't need a global definition because this is a combination of two well-known and well-established diseases. So we know that, um, that osteopenia osteoporosis could be defined particularly by DEXA, by bone mineral density, and that osteoporosis is identified also uh, when the patient suffers a minimal trauma fracture. So this is something that has been there for uh, several, what well, a couple of decades, probably three decades now, uh, was well accepted by the World Health Organization, and we do this in practice every, uh, all the time. Now, the other side, in people who have sarcopenia, is uh, important to highlight that at this moment we have different definitions. We have not reached like a global definition, but uh, I would say that independently of the definition you use to define sarcopenia, so we have the uh, recently the second European uh, uh, definition consensus, we have the American consortium, we have the Asian definition, uh, our teams in Australia and New Zealand have just finished a, a, a second Delphi uh, survey to uh, adopt a definition. Uh, so independently of the definition that we use for sarcopenia, if the person has uh, fulfilled the criteria for that definition and also has a bone mineral density below minus one standard deviation, which includes the osteopenia osteoporosis range, or the patient has suffered a fracture, then we should, and we propose that we should uh, consider that person uh, as osteosarcopenic for the purposes of, um, of uh, clinical uh, identification, diagnosis, management, and also prevention of further progression into the topic that is probably the core of this uh, seminar, which is progression into uh, frailty. So let's talk <coughs> about frailty a little bit. And I don't think this audience will need a reminder of the criteria to diagnose frailty. So uh, we know very well this definition, uh, the, the criteria that were proposed long time ago by uh, Linda Fritz and, and all the team um, presented in 2001. Um, but I invite you to have a look at the right side of the slide. There are five criteria there. And if you look at them very closely, you will see that most of them have a musculoskeletal uh, association. And why I say that is because Muscle and bone, both tissues, represent 55% of the uh, body uh, composition in an older, in a healthy older adult. That means that if we lose uh, weight, for instance, where the, at the same time we may have may be losing muscle and bone. So this is important because in within the composition of our body we have these two tissues that are closely connected and represent a significant percentage of the body composition. So we have, uh, let's talk about weakness. So weakness, very, very much a muscular characteristic, a muscular muscle fissure. So we have <coughs> sorry, weakness associated with, um, with um, probably muscle loss or uh, loss of muscle function. Walking speed is very much associated with uh, muscle 
uh, and, and with our locomotion. So for our locomotion, we need both. We need a, a very good quality of muscle and a very good quality of bones. Self-reported exhaustion, if we don't have enough locomotion, we don't have the metabolic characteristics of the, or the metabolic support by the muscle. And if we don't have a solid connection between this muscle and bone, we are going to have uh, exhaustion. Low level of physical activity, again, we don't have to go into all the details, and an, an intentional weight loss, I already mentioned about the significance of these two tissues. So you, if you look closely at these criteria, these five criteria for frailty proposed uh, uh, by Linda Fritz and colleagues, you will see that most of them we could associate to, the, um, uh, to alterations in muscle and bone. Of course, I'm not ignoring the other potential roles of the brain or cardiovascular system, but at the same time, I would like to highlight that if we don't have appropriate muscle and bone, we, uh, these uh, features are going to be evident in our patients. Now, uh, if, if we take another um, definition or another criteria to diagnose frailty, and this is the, also very well known to by the by the I'm sure by the participants in this uh, seminar. So we have the, the, um, the general um, uh, frailty index proposed by Ken Rockwood and, and colleagues. And we are going to look at the uh, <coughs> lower right side of this slide when you can see also the musculoskeletal problems, including poor limb co coordination, poor muscle tone, irregular gait pattern, and falls. This is basically the description of somebody who could have alterations in the musculoskeletal system that is go beyond the muscle health and could be con connected and combined with um, bone alterations. So here, uh, what I want to say is that every time we talk to, about frailty and we use a clinical uh, criteria, we um, are also involving or probably uh, we are um, considering that connection between muscle and bone and changes in muscle and bone that could be responsible of the development of the frailty syndrome. Again, I'm not going to ignore the other components, but at the same time, I will say that this is probably one of the major components. And I will tell you why, why I think that this has uh, really connected. Let's start from the basics. Um, uh, as uh, Jorge uh, uh, mentioned in the nice introduction, and thank you, Jorge, for that nice uh, presentation, that nice introduction. Um, I just want to mention that uh, there is a, this bio, I, I have this biomedical background, and I'm really interested in looking at the uh, osteosarcopenia and frailty syndrome from a biomedical, and most importantly, from what we call geroscience background. So when we talk about geroscience, we consider that um, there is, as you probably know, um, there is a connection, there is a common shared mechanism, biological mechanism, that explains uh, the pathophysiology of more than one chronic disease or age-related disease. So the, the, the consideration at the moment is that if we have these um, this mechanisms that are shared, then the chronic diseases and these uh, um, age-related diseases uh, could be not only identified, but also targeted as a therapeutic, uh, in, for by therapeutic interventions. In this case, I invite you to have a look at the left side. This is a, <coughs> a, um, a paper that we brought with, um, uh, my, uh, with our um, uh, postdoc, uh, here in Melbourne, Ben Kirk, uh, who has done a lot of work in osteosarcopenia. And basically what we proposed in that, in that, uh, uh, present, that paper was that osteosarcopenia is a, um, is a, uh, um, uh, a disease that has a geroscience perspective and that, is, uh, that alterations in all the mechanisms of aging could explain the osteosarcopenia, the presence of osteosarcopenia. So you can see here that we talk about metabolism, micromolecular damage, epigenetics, inflammation, adaptation to stress, proteostasis, and stem cell regeneration. These are well-known pillars of aging proposed by uh, several authors, particularly Brian Kennedy and Carlos Lopez Otin. Um, from Oviedo, they brought, they have written several uh, important papers on this. So we uh, connected and linked the presence of osteosarcopenia because these mechanisms are shared by both bone and muscle loss. 
But I would like to invite you to have a look at the other side of the, of the slide, at the right side of the slide. And look, at, this, is a, this is a paper that was, that uh, is, uh, was recently published in, uh, in the clinical, clinics of geriatric medicine, where uh, they were talking, the authors were talking about the biological mechanisms of uh, frailty. And the interesting thing is that when you look at these ones that are, uh, that are highlighted here in, in this box, when they talk about the biological mechanism of aging, they are almost identical to what we presented as the mechanisms of osteosarcopenia. They are almost identical, mentioned in a different terminology, but you will see that uh, basically we are talking about the same biological background, the same alterations um, that are um, shared by both uh, syndromes, by osteosarcopenia and fraud. And some of these uh, uh, biomed bio Medical mechanism, biological mechanisms uh, are the ones that we are targeting at this moment for the diagnosis and also for the treatment, potential treatment for osteosarcopenia and also for frailty. So this is interesting. I think that um, without going into ma too many details about the biological changes or cellular changes, we can tell that with a combination of all these different mechanisms, explain not only the presence of osteosarcopenia but also frailty. So. The, the interesting part here is to um, find uh, probably a certain level of uh, compromise or a certain level of, uh, of uh, biological changes that also include not only the mechanisms that I already said, but also changes in the hormonal levels that are associated um, with aging. And, uh, and particularly those hormonal changes that affect at the same time muscle and bone. We have these uh, hormone changes in uh, our um, osteosarcopenic patients. And when you look at this again, and you compare it with the mechanisms that are having proposed in terms of hormone changes in patients with frailty, you are going to find again that they are almost identical. When we have alterations in vitamin D and testosterone and IGF-1 uh, and all these different uh, hormones or, uh, or when we have high levels of glucocorticoids, for instance, or low levels of estrogen, we don't necessarily isolate, isolate have a compromise uh, that isolates, let's say, muscle or bone or in exclusive of muscle and bone. When we have these alterations, we have a global compromise of muscle and bone. And when you look at changes in the hormones, in these hormones are similar, almost identical to what we observe also in, um, in uh, frail older persons that have been characterized very well by multiple groups, by Jeremy Walston, uh, uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, by uh, John Morley in St. Louis. All of them have been talking about these hormonal changes that happen in, all, in frail older persons, which again are almost identical to what we observe in osteosarcopenic individuals or individuals with osteosarcopenia. So here we have a, a very interesting biological, uh, hormonal uh, um, uh, shared uh, changes between osteosarcopenia and frailty, probably with different level of severity. But we know that when it happens, when uh, when osteosarcopenia happens in our patients, basically they are at high risk of adverse outcomes. And in this case, we know that this weak and uh, of this bone, weak muscle and bone, uh, or when we have these patients with loss, loss of bone and muscle mass, there, and this is a very, very wide um, uh, uh, meta analysis uh, uh, published uh, not long ago, where they found that there is a component of both osteoporosis and sarcopenia and a high risk of falls and fractures in these individuals. And um, this is probably also very interesting because we know that there is a, a clinic, from the clinical perspective, osteosarcopenia and frailty share multiple characteristics. When you look at the left side, this is a recent uh, publication on osteosarcopenia and the clinical outcomes of osteosarcopenia we have these uh, similarities. Actually, they included frailty as one of these uh, predisposing factors of alterations that are associated with osteosarcopenia that bring to the, uh, or increase the risk of mortality or fracture and falls. This, um, I invite you to have a look at this interesting um, um, review. Uh, something that was particularly interested is the conclusion that still we need uh, some longitudinal analysis 
uh, of uh, cohorts to define these characteristics on uh, or define whether this uh, higher incidence of fracture and falling is particular of uh, the osteoporotic osteopenic component or the sarcopenic or both. Uh, but nevertheless, we have here the similarity. You look at the left uh, and the right side, which is what I have been uh, trying to do in the, my last two or three slides, is you can see, you can see that, that we have very similar um, um, outcomes. And if you look at the right side, which is a very nice uh, review on frailty and sarcopenia, you see that uh, as we have also demonstrated in oste osteosarcopenia, that in the frailty group, they always have, they also have uh, the same that we are very similar to what we observed in uh, osteosarcopenia, where loss, falls, recurrent hospital admissions, malnutrition, institutionalization. We observe that in osteosarcopenia as well. I already mentioned about high mortality and disability. Of course, if, we, if somebody has falls, fractures, if somebody has a disability and has to be institutionalized, then there is increased health cost and polypharmacy, of course, and fragility fracture. Why I leave uh, delirium to the end is because definitely I don't think there is a uh, proof or at this moment I have not seen uh, a report of, com of a connection between uh, osteosarcopenia and uh, cognitive or uh, cognitive impairment or delirium or any kind of uh, neurodegenerative disorders. But I'm sure that uh, people are working at this moment uh, looking at this uh, potential connection. For the moment, we know that there's a purely musculoskeletal connection that nevertheless represent an impact on the whole perspective of uh, function uh, that we also observe in the fra in frail older persons. So here you see again from the clinical perspective how similar these two syndromes are. So the five million dollar questions uh, question is what happens first? What are we talking about here? What is what, uh, do we start with? And um, we have proposed in that uh, in that uh, sense we have proposed. Um, probably two different perspectives and two different trajectories for osteosarcopenia that are still under consideration. One is we have identified, and this is something from our previous studies, that sometimes the people who are younger in our cohorts have um, sarcopenia first, they develop weakness, they start falling over, and then they start developing osteopenia, uh, and then they progress into osteoporosis, then it comes associated with functional impairment from the falls and fractures, and then they become frail. Um, and uh, after becoming frail, they develop this level of disability that uh, we all know associated of following frailty. This is a linear kind of, of uh, model. As this model assumes that, again, it starts with sarcopenia. We observe that sarcopenia starts at an early age, and then osteopenia osteoporosis de develops at a later age. But it's much dependent on uh, the presence or absence of risk factors that I already mentioned uh, before. So um, this is probably not the same uh, because we don't have patients, we don't have homogeneous, I will say, population uh, in, uh, in what we have observed amongst uh, osteosarcopenic uh, patients. So we don't know yet whether that linear model is the one that is the right one, or maybe I have already proposed this different cycle where we have a robust individual that for many reasons, many risk factors that I already mentioned, many bi uh, bi uh, biomedical components, bi maybe basic uh, sciences components, um, probably geroscience, common mechanism. We have this robust individual that, who uh, develops osteosarcopenia. And then this vicious cycle starts where the osteosarcopenic person starts uh, suffering falls and fractures. And after having a fall or a fracture or both, with which we observe in, in osteosarcopenic patients, we have, uh, they develop social isolation, fear of falling, physical dependence, malnutrition, and of course develop a poor quality of life. This, um, they could keep turning around in this cycle, uh, or they will uh, develop frailty. And uh, after they develop frailty, they uh, develop disability and or institutionalization. This is probably more dynamic. I will say that compared to the linear one that we have here, maybe the way people with osteosarcopenic patients or patients with osteosarcopenia reach frailty uh, is through this uh, vicious cycle. 
And the importance of this, and probably one of, the, of my first take home messages, is that it's important first that we identify who, uh, who is robust, uh, uh, or the person who is going to develop osteosarcopenia if we want to predict, uh, uh, we want to prevent all these uh, complications and we want, very importantly, we want to prevent the development of frailty. So we uh, have to try to break, to, to block this uh, development. We, we, try, we aim to maintain the person in a robust uh, stage. But what happens if somebody already developed this osteosarcopenia, then we try to uh, block the, the cycle once the patient is within this vicious cycle here. So we, we have to develop interventions that um, have an impact on not only prevention of falls and fractures in these patients, but also if they already had a fall, some fra or, a fall or a fracture, then we can prevent the consequences before they, go, they get into the frailty status. So um, I think the overall conclusion from this uh, proposed uh, um, um, cycles is that um, we should act early and we should be able to identify patients who are at risk of developing frailty. And in, with this in mind, we have this collaboration with, uh, with the island study from Taiwan uh, in which we try to answer the question whether first, whether we have, uh, whether our patients have uh, uh, osteosarcopenia first or sarcopenia or osteoporosis and, we, and whether these patients develop this progressive uh, uh, frailty uh, if they are osteosarcopenic, if they progress into uh, frailty, uh, whether this is a dynamic model, whether people can come back to normal. Um, to do that, we uh, have analyzed data from community dwelling older persons, and some of you are already familiar with this study. Very interesting uh, cohort followed for, uh, for six years. And uh, our uh, PhD students, Mishka and Fatima, uh, who is also a geriatrician, um, is looking at it. Here are the population characteristics. And uh, basically what we found was interesting because, and this is all preliminary data. This has not been published yet. Uh, this is our preliminary analysis, but I, will, I wanted to share this with you because what we have found is quite interesting. One of the things that we found very interesting is that uh, amongst the osteosarcopenic patients that we or no patients, we're talking about participants in, the, in this longitudinal cohort, uh, a significant uh, percentage of those patients, osteosarcopenic, of uh, those participants are um, peripheral. So there was some kind of, uh, of uh, connection in this case, or uh, this, uh, this is community dwelling. So this was probably a goal opportunity to identify these people who are uh, uh, osteosarcopenic and are peripheral because they most likely going to progress, as I mentioned before, into um, uh, osteosarcopenia. But this is just the general description, the general characteristics. When we apply the criteria for people uh, osteosarcopenia, people who have osteopenia, osteoporosis, and sarcopenia. Of course, 5% uh, is, uh, or 6% of the, our whole population is relatively low. This is probably the, 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 the core uh, population of interest for us. Of course, uh, we have a significant number of uh, people who are not uh, osteopenic or non osteosporotic. This is a little bit different from what we have observed in our own cohort here in Melbourne, where we, but these are different patients. These are patients with faults and fractures. So we observe instead of having 5% of osteosarcopenic patients in our population here in, in Melbourne, we have in our um, cohort here, we observe a, a much higher the prevalence of osteosarcopenia, but interestingly about the same connection with pre-frailty and frailty. So then uh, in collaboration with our um, biostatistics and data management here at, at, at our institute, we elaborated these connections, this uh, uh, trying to replicate the cycle that I showed you before in a way that we can see who from the non-frail develops pre-frail and frailty, who, how many did we lose, how many died, and trying to look at all these dynamic models in a way that how many of the patients that we identified that osteosarcopenic and frail 
could come back into peripheral at the same time that we that they the osteosarcopenia change. So we try to do this uh, this analysis, and it's quite a, a lot of different analysis. So I didn't want to bring everything today uh, because of interest of time, but I just want to to share with you this because I find it very interesting, um, and this is uh, probably the core of what we found. Uh, and uh, we use different adjusted models. You can see them uh, in the uh, upper section of the slide. Um, and what we interestingly found was that uh, the incidence of osteosarcopenia, um, in, independent of the models, the incidence of osteosarcopenia and the risk of developing, this is the important thing, the risk of develop, developing frailty in the context of osteopenia, osteoporosis, sarcopenia, or osteosarcopenia, is much much higher and higher even higher than uh, in people with sarcopenia, uh, independently of these models. So all the models throughout all the models that we use, the risk of developing uh, um, frailty if you are osteosarcopenic is much higher than if you have sarcopenia alone, and much more higher if you have osteoporosis or osteopenia alone. So there is a component of combined uh, uh, impact and combined effect from having osteosporosis and sarcopenia together into the development of frailty. So overall, this again, this is preliminary data. I just found it very exciting and I wanted to share with you because uh, I think that um, we, are, we have been able to uh, demonstrate that this is a dynamic model, that this is a dynamic behavior, but at the same time, what we, maybe we don't start the story with sarcopenia alone, maybe we don't start the story with osteoporosis alone or osteopenia alone, but once they come together, once they, a person develops both osteoporosis and sarcopenia, the risk of developing frailty is much higher. But at the same time, this uh, that I just show you is uh, just identified by, um, by uh, um, clinical characteristics, characteristics and clinical criteria. Uh, for sarcopenia and frailty, of course, we need uh, uh, osteosarcopenia and frailty. Of course, we need uh, uh, bone mineral density to identify people with um, osteoporosis and osteopenia. But what about if we can find a biomarker, a biomarker that is able to uh, identify people uh, with osteosarcopenia, or at least is able to demonstrate or link with one of these zero signs, common mechanisms for osteosarcopenia and frailty. What about if we can identify those uh, a biomarker? Um, and some people, I mean, many people, many groups have been trying to identify a biomarker. And I'm, I'm sure that uh, each one of you guys uh, attending this conference will be working in one of these that are listed here. This is a recent uh, review on the biomarkers that have been associated with frailty. Why I'm showing this is because when I look at the biomarkers or at the alterations that you see here, most of these alterations, interestingly, are, have been also associated with muscle and bone loss. So um, I'm not going to talk about all these biomarkers, but if you look also, you remember the initial slide that I showed you about the geroscience uh, hypothesis, we can see that some of these um, biomarkers are closely linked with uh, the, bio, the uh, geroscience hypothesis. We can see that people that, um, that um, some people have been studying uh, inflammation, people uh, uh, oxidative stress, uh, some metabolic alterations that we, we know. Uh, some people are looking at cardiovascular um, um, changes, but overall and importantly changes in amino acids and vitamins. And when you look at these changes in amino acids and vitamins, for instance, or in inflammation, the same biomarkers, the same changes happen in, um, in osteosarcopenic individuals. However, and this is interesting, is that a lot of these biomarkers are affected by aging itself. So it's very hard unless you know, there is a, a, a certain connection between the changes that happen in the serum levels or the uh, alterations in these um, levels of these factors. It's, di it's difficult to know whether what is happening is just normal aging, if that is osteosarcopenia or is frailty. Um, typical examples, for instance, uh, is the interleukin-6. We see this in elevation interleukin-6, but is it just related with inflammation or normal aging, or is it related to as a mechanism uh, to develop osteosarcopenia and frailty? So we are trying to work on a, on a biomarker and uh, something that will tell us 
yes, first, there is a connection, biological connection. Second, um, is the levels of this biomarker don't change with aging. That's important. So we, we have the same levels the, throughout our life. But if you have osteosarcopenia, you have lower levels of this marker. Uh, if you have frailty, you have even lower, uh, much lower levels of the marker. Uh, and if you treat the patient, then those biomarkers will correct. This is probably the most important criteria to develop in terms of a biomarker. And that's why we have been proposing, and I will just talk a little bit about uh, this interesting uh, population of, uh, of circulating uh, uh, osteoprogenitor cells. We call, it, we call them COP cells. And uh, these COP cells um, are cells that we, some people consider, and we, we think that is, they have some kind of a stromal uh, and STEM uh, characteristics in uh, STEMness, I would say. And when I say STEMness is because they are able to differentiate into uh, muscle, into bone cells. Um, and interestingly, these cells are in our circulation. So we can quantify them. Uh, I will not go into all the details. This is something that we, uh, that my uh, PhD student Jack Feehan um, uh, has published extensively in the last uh, five years. But what we we can tell is that we have these these stem cells, these uh, circulating uh, osteoprogenitors, um, that um, uh, could have, and we don't know exactly the, the origin of these cells. We know that they can have a hematopoietic uh, or a mesenchymal-like. Uh, characteristics, but at the same time, we know that they are in our circulation stable, same levels throughout our life. So we can, we quantify them at people from 20 to 100 year old, and the circulating the numbers of, of COP cells remain steady. However, we have been also uh, able to correlate changes in um, COP cell levels, particularly percentage of circulating uh, osteoprogenitors, percentage of COP cells with alterations that are characteristic of osteosarcopenia. So we have been, and this, is, and this has been recently published, we have been able to demonstrate that higher our numbers of uh, or uh, COP cells, or much, or I better say lower our, our uh, number of COP cells, our percentage of COP cells, then uh, higher the likelihood of developing osteosarcopenia, having low bone mineral density, or having uh, low um, uh, appendicular lean mass. This is interesting because there is a clear connection then between osteoporosis, osteosarcopenia, sorry, and COP cells. Now, we have also, and this is another geriatrician who did a PhD with, uh, with us here in Melbourne, uh, and Sydney, sorry, uh, Pimali Gunawardini. Uh, and basically what she did, she um, also looked at, uh, at uh, um, COP cells, percentage of COP cells, uh, in uh, subgroups, classified uh, patients, uh, participants, sorry, classified as uh, uh, fit, peripheral, and frail. Interestingly, what she found uh, was that in older persons who are frail, the percentage of COP cells is significantly lower. And uh, what I found much more interesting was that when she looked at the correlation with the uh, with frailty uh, defined by Fritz or Rockwoods. Um, it was much more significant and high, a stronger correlation with this than the usual interleukin-6 uh, quantification. So um, in some sense, this is a small study, but in some sense, what we can agree uh, is that low levels of COP cells uh, are correlated with uh, osteosarcopenia and frailty. We therefore uh, published a uh, review on that, updated an old review about COP cells and at the Journal of Bone and Mineral Research very recently, in which we um, uh, proposed that uh, in what we call the states of abnormal tissue regeneration, within, which includes osteoporosis, sarcopenia, and frailty, we have this reduction in COP uh, numbers. And therefore, it, uh, the muscle performance, the uh, capacity of the bone to, to, to perform a, a good turnover is decreased. And um, this has been uh, probably uh, confirmed by two things. And some of these are come from our groups. One is that you have, an, uh, that, as I said, we have normal uh, levels of COP cell throughout our life. So that's, that's important. Second, if you have too many, and this is, uh, these are very interesting uh, studies by uh, Bob, uh, Robert Pignolo uh, at the Mayo Clinic, where they have demonstrated that you have too many, too many COP cells, then we can have 
uh, um, uh, um, problems with calcification. So we have a heterotopic calcification, aortic calcification, and we have uh, some issues with fracture healing. If we have too low, so low levels below the normal range, the normal reference range, then our patients have osteosarcopenia frailty. Again, why we think this is an interesting biomarker is because the levels are steady in normal healthy individuals, but the levels are high in alterations in terms of hypermetabolic and hyperformation uh, syndromes and are low in tissue loss syndromes such as osteosarcopenia and frailty. This is our argument for uh, COP cells, but at the same time, we are trying to identify techniques, imaging techniques that are going to help us to identify osteosarcopenia and frailty. And, and in that, we have been working with our uh, fellows here, uh, Ibrahim Bani Hassan and Madi Imani, to develop uh, tools that, uh, and softwares and uh, using artificial intelligence to quantify bone mass to look at this, and you see at the right side, you can see that the blue uh, disappeared, the blue was the bone, then we can quantify the, the, the red marrow, and then we can even extract what we call the bone marrow, because fat is an important component, fat infiltration is an important component, not only of sarcopenia, fat infiltration within the muscle, and I'm not talking about obesity here, I'm not talking about BMI, this is completely independent of BMI, we have this fat infiltrating the muscle, the bone, and you can see here in the lower right corner, you can see a muscle also using the same technique, extracted using the same technique and with a yellow infiltration. This is fat within the muscle. Uh, uh, and uh, through artificial intelligence, we, we have been able to um, quantify this, not only in osteosarcopenic individuals, but also in frail older persons. And the last part of my talk, we'll talk a little bit about uh, treating osteosarcopenia while preventing frailty. So how can we break this vicious cycle that I mentioned before? How can we treat two birds with one stone in a way that we can first improve muscle mass, second improve bone mass, and third uh, prevent frailty? Well, um, the, the, the in, uh, studies in osteosarcopenia are just starting to be published. So there are some studies showing uh, how uh, resistance uh, in exercise, so talking about exercise, we know that, and I, I think you already had a, sim, a symposium on, on exercise and frailty, so I'm not going to talk about that today. But I can tell you that these are very small studies in osteosarcopenia. We don't know if they, when they treated the, this with the, with the exercise, uh, we were able to prevent frailty. But at the same time, we know that our international recommendations could have an impact, and we included uh, subsections in terms of how can we improve muscle and bone mass and also how can we prevent uh, frailty. So I invite you to have a look at this because definitely exercise is an intervention that should break that vicious cycle. A strength and balance exercise are required not only for osteosarcopenia, but also for frailty. Um, when we did the review about uh, non-pharmacological intervention for osteosarcopenia, basically the, uh, the lack of a randomized control trial uh, targeting both muscle and bone, uh, actually there are very few that uh, target both of them. So we don't know whether we can, uh, with these uh, different interventions, are we going to prevent both muscle and bone and most importantly, frailty. But if you look at our conclusions uh, of another um, uh, review that we perform, um, we probably agree that what you see here is uh, almost identical to what we recommend to prevent frailty in clinical practice. So it's very similar in terms of the non-pharmacological interventions uh, regarding the prevention of frailty, regarding uh, vitamin D levels, optimi optimizing vitamin D levels, uh, and giving the, some of these interventions non-pharmacological. So for the clinicians here, and for the, especially for the community uh, clinicians, we develop these algorithms where we integrate First, uh, somebody who had a fall or fracture, somebody that has a sarcopenia, an osteosarcopenia, then what we do, we uh, intervene for both, for, um, uh, for uh, osteoporosis and sarcopenia. We expect that because we don't have the longitudinal data yet, but we expect that by performing these interventions, progressive resistance, nutritional supplementation, and anti-resortive or anabolic therapies for osteoporosis, then we can have an effect. The future directions, maybe we can find something that has an impact on both, on muscle and bone. And that's something that um, uh, Serge Ferrari from Switzerland have been trying to do with denosumab, which is a very well-known treatment for osteoporosis. The major trials, initial trial for osteoporosis for denosumab showed that 
it also reduced falls, unexpectedly reduced falls in these individuals. So what the search did was also measure, uh, he measured the muscle function or the appendicular uh, lean mass and muscle function and uh, people treated with bisphosphonates and the nosumab and they, found, and they found that the nosumab treated patients have better fun muscle function. We did a similar treatment, it's more, a similar uh, study, but much smaller in terms of sample. This was a pilot study by Stephen Fu, our uh, postdoctoral fellow here. Uh, and we found that um, similar to what they found, people treated on the, with the nosumab had much better performance in terms of muscle, uh, perf muscle function. Um, does it have an impact on preventing fracture or uh, sorry, preventing fall or preventing frailty uh, uh, after uh, a fracture, let's say? We don't know yet, but this is something we are working on. Uh, and finally, um, there is a uh, nice evidence from uh, the group from uh, Joshua Hare in Miami and Florida um, who uh, treated, uh, uh, developed phase two trials or conducted phase two trials treating uh, frail older persons with, uh, uh, with uh, stem cell infusion. These stem cells, have, they have to go aspirate the cells from, uh, from the bone marrow and then infuse them. Interestingly, these uh, this, uh, allergenic um, um, uh, infusions have an impact on frailty. What we are trying to do, and we are, this is what we are, our model is that probably COP cells, isolating COP cells, and we develop the method to isolate millions and millions of COP cells uh, we will be able to easily, we don't have to go into the bone marrow, we just take a buffy cuts from the blood bank and we really isolate these cup cells and we're going to inject them uh, uh, in, 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 in frail older persons or older persons with osteosarcopenia and we're going to evaluate the impact. So in summary, osteosarcopenia, falls and fractures and frailty are connected. I hope that I was able to uh, illustrate the connection and uh, with aging, we know that this common biological mechanism for osteosarcopenia and frailty are triggered. Um, <clears throat> there are uh, risk factors that are shared and amongst them physical inactivity and poor nutrition are key drivers of that progression. And um, I will um, suggest that we should focus on identifying osteosarcopenia in clinical practice if we want to prevent the development of frailty. And um, if we um, hopefully we are going to uh, have uh, um, effective interventions, including pharmacological interventions that will have an impact on both uh, osteosarcopenia and frailty. So with this, I would like to thank again for the invitation. Thank to all our collaborators around the world and uh, the, uh, the uh, funding agencies who have been uh, very supportive of our uh, work. And um, thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to answer uh, your question. Thank you, Gustavo, for uh, a stimulating and thought-provoking presentation. And, and we'll wait for questions. I have a, actually a, one question. And uh, it's, it's about, I think, I'm sure there's a lot of interest on COP cells, but that's the first one. Uh, I may have missed this, but how do you measure COP cells? Can it be through a blood test? That's, that's, a, good, that's a good question. We do it at, uh, by flow cytometry. So we have a panel of antibodies that we use to identify them and to, uh, to isolate them. So it's, uh, it's, it could be performed at any, any center that has flow cytometry. So every hospital, every major lab will have a flow cytometry machine. So it's very easy to measure. While we wait for some other questions, and I have a question because I, um, the, what you uh, presented about COP cells seems like a very exciting development and I'm sure there's a lot of work to be done there. Uh, you mentioned, you, you presented the data on frailty and how uh, COP cells are reduced in patients with frailty compared with the peripheral and robust. That was a cross-sectional study, right? That was a cross-sectional, yeah, effect. Of course, you show that over time, of course, compared with younger individuals, the COP cells remain stable, but in those with osteosarcopenia, they decline and frailty looks, looks like. Right. So exactly. are, are, they, are they doing studies in, a co in your cohorts in which they are measuring the COP cells uh, longitudinally? No, I don't. I don't think. I don't think anybody has done it. We are. We are doing it actually at this moment as we speak. We have the Brimbank Aging Well study that is a cohort study that is being conducted by uh, Michigan Fatima, the same geriatrician I mentioned, the PhD student. And yes, we are following here those patients for six years um, in terms of, uh, and we are measuring COP cells. So we are not only replicating what we did with the Taiwanese group. But we are also looking because the Taiwanese, of course, they didn't measure COP cells, so it's not was not included in the, in the 
in the in the assessments, but here we're measuring COP cells every two years in order to determine whether those levels go down progressively and how they play the role into this dynamic uh, model that we propose for Australian frailty. Great. Uh, and there is another question, Gustavo, from Carmen Castillo, and she asked, do COP cells increase with physical exercise and activity? They could be used to monitor treatment. Okay. You mentioned it's a biomarker, but have you? do you have any evidence of that? Yeah, no, we don't have evidence of that. And I think that that's, that's an interesting question because uh, um, something that we don't know is how interventions impact on, on, on COP cells. We know, though, we know that in people, we actually publish that, we administer vitamin D uh, to, um, that was in, in uh, healthy individuals, but still we gave them vitamin D and we were able to demonstrate how COP cells go up. Uh, and vitamin D administration after vitamin D. That was a pilot study by Jack Fee the same person I mentioned, the same PhD student. And he did that um, and we were able to show the vitamin D, which you know, vitamin D is an anabolic factor. It stimulates stem cells. It's uh, used in uh, osteosarcopenia and frailty uh, and vitamin D deficiency is very prevalent in these patients. So I think that, that that makes sense in terms of the connection between the biomarker, the intervention and the entity. And in these individuals that you are mentioning, they were healthy, but were they vitamin D deficient or had low levels? Or they, they were vitamin D deficient, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, there is another question from Olga Theo. Uh, should we be focusing on single biomarkers or is it possible that a combination of biomarkers is driving the results? This is a very good question, and I will tell you a personal answer. I, I think that that's a, that I, I think that I would prefer as a clinician to have one biomarker that will tell me everything, one biomarker that will not confuse me with the normal aging process, one biomarker that identifies the severity of the of the of the disease, and a biomarker that shows me therapeutic response. So I don't think that uh, that we have that magic biomarker. I mean, I, I'm biased. And I'm biased with the COP cells, but uh, you know, each one of us probably in this room has uh, their favorite bi biomarker, but I think that we need just one biomarker that will confirm, and this is also important, will confirm the clinical criteria. So we'll connect with the clinical criteria. If we identify somebody as frail or as osteosarcopenic, the biomarker should connect with it, and also with the severity of the disease. That's probably what so far I think COP cells have brought very interesting into this picture. Right, and especially for clinicians, that will be even more a practical way of, of monitoring their patients and, and for diagnosis purposes too, I guess. Exactly, yeah. Uh, another uh, question from Constantina Katsoulis. Nice presentation. Are you seeing sex, sex differences in COP levels? No. No, we found, we found exactly the same. Uh, we, when we wrote the paper, and uh, this is the, from a different study, it was uh, the, COP, the COP study, we, um, we, we uh, mentioned that this is like when, when you look at the neutrophils or lymphocytes population, you know, you have the same level, the same percentage of neutrophils all your life. It only changes when you have an infection. Yeah, uh, uh, so it's the same with COP cells. It seems that they are steady levels all our life, but when we have a disease, then they change. And that's what we are interested in looking at. Okay, another question from... Uh... Uh, Gustavo Vargas about the type of exercise prescription that you recommend. I guess you mentioned resistance, but uh, any other uh, open or chain kinetic exercises, resistant training, Tai Chi? Well, um, in, in terms of osteosarcopenia, we know that we have to use um, interventions, exercise interventions that have an impact on both muscle and bone. So it's important to, to, to highlight here at this audience that um, resistance exercise is important, but we have to change the direction of the resistance exercise. We have to, to change the, 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 the routine. And this is uh, and this because we are, if we want to target bone, the bone side of the story, we know that bone has trabeculae and trabeculae go in the different directions. If we only work in one direction, we are going to make the one set of trabeculae better, but the other ones will still be weak. So the important point on resistance exercise when we are targeting somebody with osteosarcopenia is that they, we should target in a way that we, can, we change this, um, this direction of the exercises. The second point is balance exercise. Um, and unfortunately, Tai Chi has been, been tried to, to treat both osteoporosis and sarcopenia. We know that it's very good with balance. We know that it could prevent falls. 
but uh, it doesn't have an impact on muscle bone loss. So uh, we, we don't think that they, there's a strong evidence to show that. And other interventions, we, we actually summarize them in, in that paper in the Journal of Nutrition, Health and Aging with Mikkel Skierdo, who presented at the, one of these seminars, I think. So um, basically what we have is, um, is that uh, uh, these exercises work, but if you want to target both muscle and bone and prevent frailty, then you need to do it at least twice a week at least uh, for at least half an hour and continuously for at least six months in order to observe a uh, beneficial impact. Okay. Another question from Deepak Jagias Baba. How long does it take for cup cell transfusions to start showing effects on muscle strength? Well, we don't know that we don't have the answer because this is something that we are doing as we speak. So uh, we don't have the answer. Well, you know, it took us five years to develop the technique to isolate them and to expand them. So we are in that process the, of, of trying to inject them. So we don't know, we don't know yet. Yeah, naturally I, I was part of the trial with Josh Hare and treating uh, uh, frailty with the stem cells. And just before infusing the patients, we have to wait like four or five hours to prepare the stem cells. So I can imagine what it takes to <laughs> prepare them for the first time and, and infuse them on patients. Exactly, right, yeah. There is a question from, uh, uh, our friend uh, Pancho, Pepe Pancho Parodi from Peru, uh, uh, what would be the potential value of intervening in social determinants of health, I guess, related to osteosarcopenia? Do you know any initiative or publication in which biomarkers have been used for this purpose? In social determinants, uh, yes. Uh, actually, um, there are a few groups. Uh, one of the groups is actually here by Professor Sharon Brennan Olsen. She has worked on social determinants of osteosarcopenia. And uh, yes, there are, there, are, there are a few. I think that, um, that one of the important correlations she found was that in people with uh, lower socioeconomic status have the higher levels of, uh, I mean, high prevalence of uh, osteosarcopenia, which is not surprising, but high levels of C-reactive protein as one of the biomarkers that she tested. So it seems that the inflammation component is very much associated with the socioeconomic uh, determinants. But I think that um, this is something that we are going to have uh, new data now that we are starting to recognize more and more about the occurrence of osteosarcopenia in our populations. Great. I think we are uh, over the time, uh, Slodet, and thank you again for, to Gustavo for this excellent presentation. And thank you for the audience for participating. And I just want to uh, thank you for uh, participating in this series that end for today with Gustavo, but preparing you for the next series for 2022 and 2023. We'll be announcing in the next few days the uh, roster of speakers. We have an exciting lineup uh, and we hope that you'll join us again. We'll be sending you the emails with information to register for a new series uh, for the next cycle in September. And um, please do not forget to complete your evaluations of this talk and other talks and, and thank you again and take care. Bye-bye, Gustavo. Take care. Thank you very much. Thank you.